Hello and welcome to the Monday, January 22nd, 2024 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. We've got some uh, really interesting uh, malware from Xavier on Friday. This particular malware runs on Mac OS. It's written in Python and it's designed to emulate and replace two crypto coin applications, the Exodus crypto wallet and Bitcoin core. Once a user downloads and executes the Python script, it will first collect some information about the host. It will set up a connection to a command control server that then may send additional Python commands to execute. All of this is done pretty simple, pretty straightforward. It's just base64 encoded. So really no attempt here to do anything more sophisticated when it comes to sort of obfuscation or encryption. It then also downloads replacements for the Exodus app and the Bitcoin Core app. Not really clear at this point what these particular uh, replacements will do. Uh, They also include the Electron framework. And that's, of course, used by a lot of uh, desktop applications these days to make it easy to develop them a little bit sort of OS agnostic. It does require that the victim has the has Xcode installed because it does actually compile an, a script, an OSA a script that's uh, being installed as a part of the malicious uh, package. Like I said, the script doesn't really do anything special kind of in order to obfuscate itself. It still has a very low virus total score when uh, Xavier looked at it, it was just a three out of 59. That has since improved a little bit to 17. The first upload to virus total was on the 18th, so that was a Thursday. And then there was a lot of news about accounts at Microsoft being compromised. And I just want to talk briefly about some of the lessons learned here. First of all, the attacker did use password spraying for initial access. That refers to the attacker trying many different user IDs and only a few different passwords for each user ID, which of course avoids any lockout controls that you may have in place for failed logins. The next step then was that this account, this account was compromised using password spring, had the ability to access the email accounts of a few executives and people in the security department. It's not clear if these were the only accounts that this particular compromised account had access to, but what's more likely is that these were just the accounts that the attacker was interested in. Apparently the attacker was looking for communication relating to the attacker. And that's a very typical thing to do for attackers where they are trying to figure out what sort of the adversary here, in this case, Microsoft knows about them. So a couple lessons learned here. First of all, password spraying is a threat. It usually is linked to weak passwords. So make sure that you have controls in place to either enforce weak passwords. In this case, apparently sort of a little bit of forgotten legacy account That's another thing that you sort of need to control accounts that have apparently some elevated privileges that are no longer used need to be removed at some point. But in particular, when it comes to weak passwords, it should be much easier and faster for you to check for weak passwords in your environment than it is for an attacker to actually do brute forcing. So that's certainly something that you do need to check. Check the have I been pwned lists check uh, any other leaks that you may be aware of of passwords and of course not the top 10 top 100 passwords that are commonly used by attackers make sure that you got them covered as a more advanced uh, control here having some documents some emails as a honey token that relate to attackers may be a nice idea to add to environment but only spend your time on that if you have the other basic things like passwords and such under control. And Watchtower seems to be on a roll lately and published a nice blog post with details regarding four recently patched Juniper vulnerabilities. Probably 
the more secure one here is an authentication bypass where it's relatively easy with sort of a guessable URL to retrieve password hashes. Now, the hashes aren't terrible, they're salted, they use SHA-512, but still you know, not a real great hashing algorithm and uh, definitely uh, brute forceable than offline once an attacker gets a hold of this particular file. Also, a number of cross-site scripting vulnerabilities that, of course, could always be exploited then as a follow-on. As usual, once we have some detailed write-ups like this, Consider these vulnerabilities exploited in the wild. And Brave noted that they're going to get rid of the strict fingerprinting protection. The Brave browser, based on Chrome, is advertised as a more privacy-focused browser. I use it myself quite a bit. The standard fingerprinting mode is quite good in preventing many of the commonly used fingerprinting methods. What Brave said is that the strict mode, which was optional, does cause too many websites to break, so uh, cause some user frustration. Also, only a small enough percentage of users, they talk about 0.5%, are actually using that mode, which actually is counterproductive because that itself makes them somewhat fingerprintable then. Well, and this is it for today. So thanks for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.